Hey everybody, this is Cheng Ron, and I am in Houston, Texas, in the Medical Center. And we're in this event called the Functional Medicine Grand Rounds. And uh, I have Dr. Joseph Vance on here. He is the CEO of El Nutra, makers of the fasting mimicking diet. And the reason we're talking today, uh, I'm really excited, is that I have been looking into uh, time-restricted eating, fasting, all the stuff like that in terms of medical benefits. But the most exciting data in 2019 that I've seen is the fasting mimicking diet. And so for those of you who are not familiar with the fasting mimicking diet, I have the perfect person to explain it to you. So let's just start with what really is the fasting mimicking diet? Yeah, well, thank you very much for hosting me today. Uh, just to refresh, uh, I'm the CEO of El Nutra, the company that actually licenses all the rights for the fasting mimicking diet and launches them globally. Um, so. Fasting mimicking diet, I would say, was the reason behind all this fasting new segment in nutrition was born. It was uh, a lot of our trials back in 2012 and 13 and 14 that kind of launched this concept. And the fasting mimicking diet is a way to eat while keeping the cells fasting. And it's an oxymoron, and I'll, I'll explain it. So basically think about it. If you eat, the food goes into your stomach, then it goes through digestion, then goes into the bloodstream, then goes to the cells. The cells has, have antennas that, that actually we call them nutrient sensing pathways. So they sense the food and then when they recognize there's food, they don't fast. The fasting mimicking diet is basically plant-based, healthy, no artificials, no chemicals, but it gets into your blood and then when it gets to the cells, it doesn't trigger the sensing pathway. So the cell doesn't read the radars of the cells, don't really get the sense of there is food and therefore the cells are fasting while the body is nourished. And this is the, the innovation and invention behind it. So I mean, the, the physiology behind this, it sounds complex, but actually I think it's kind of easy to really understand. <clears throat> as we go through life, we age, right? And as we age, there's certain cells and certain things in our body that gets damaged. And in the attempt to clean up that damage, there's a whole process. In the attempt to, to regenerate uh, whatever is already, already swept away is another whole other process. Yes. And that's, I think that's the mecca of sort of the, the longevity yes. right now, correct? For sure. Yeah. Um, and and you, hit, you hit the point right there and why, why we developed a mimicking diet for fasting because we wanted to allow the body to fast for a longer period. And typically it's five days. And why we wanted to allow the body to fast for five days? Because as you said, initially, the first couple of days, the body's okay using fat as a source of energy. But the longer you go, the longer the body is now at a bigger stress and needs to start restructuring the cells intracellularly or even triggering stem cell regeneration in the body. So the body is trying to take an extra step and it's the first time in the history of medicine that we're describing food impacting intracellular regeneration and potentially stem cell regeneration. And that regeneration is fixing now, is a little bit helping the body to biologically a little bit go backwards and as you know aging is the mother of a lot of diseases and if you're helping the body to stay healthier longer then you're actually helping your longevity right and i can you know sit here and say to the audience like hey you know water fast is good juice fast is good you know so so on and so forth right but what the fasting mimicking diet has is a ton of data and uh, and that data is so robust it kind of overwhelms me a little bit <laughs> but they all point towards the same thing so let's talk about how you were able to gather this data and who funds this these studies yes. that we're doing on diet because that's not a thing that we do in america usually yes yeah, so in in you hit you hit the right point in in nutrition there's really the level of science that exists in biotech I think pharma and biotech are ahead of nutrition, not because a pill is more effective than medicine, right. than, than nutrition, it's because we put more regulations and investment into discovering the pill versus putting more science behind nutrition. But I think there's an exception here with the fasting mimicking diet. And very early on, a, a big pioneer in the field, uh, Professor Walter Longo, who's the founder actually of Amutra, and he's the head of the Longevity Institute at USC, for the audience listening to us, a lot of you know him, and he was, he was named by Time Magazine just four months ago as uh, among the top 50 most influential people in health. Mm -hmm. He was actually diligent enough to go back to the bench and do lab analysis on fasting and then do mice trials and do human trials. And because he followed the same uh, level of scrutiny and level of trials like the biotech industry, 
the government actually through the National Institute of Health, the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Aging stood behind him and funded a lot of his trials. So the fasting and making diet up until today has almost $50 million in grants now. Wow. Donated mostly, granted mostly by the NIH, but also a lot of European uh, government donors to the project and a lot of universities and other, uh, you know, nonprofits supporting here. So we're really excited today, not just because the FMD is really effective on aging and metabolic health, et cetera, mm -hmm. but because for the first time we're cementing this concept of food is medicine, not by effectiveness only, but now by proof. Yeah, so that proof, that really, that proof is coming to be more and more. So there are a few things that you said today that's about to be published, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in, the, in ways that are far more than just looking at meta, metabolomics, right? And so uh, what's interesting, so tell, tell me about, tell me about the, the, the cancer research that's, that's happening right now. And how do you think it's, it's really gonna change the way we view, we view cancer therapy? Um, we've been actually studying cancer for over, I would say, 12 years now with oh, fasting. Wow. Okay. And the theory in mice was, um, if you fast, you know, today in practice, we go and we say, we're gonna lose weight when we do chemotherapy, so let's eat. Yes. But actually what our trials are finding could be even the opposite. And our theory was, once you have cancer, it's one of the fastest growing organ in the body, and it is the fastest growing organ in the body. It's a crazy cell that keeps replicating. And the last thing you want to do is to come and fuel the cell with macronutrients such as protein and, and, and carbohydrates or high level of those. Or you don't want to even increase insulin or what we call IGF, meaning growth factors to grow cancer. Right, right. So our theory was if we go and we fast uh, uh, the body right before chemotherapy, you're basically starving cancer. So you're, you sensitize cancer to chemotherapy rather than you're feeding cancer and you're equipping cancer with its own defense. And the same thing you're actually, when you fast before chemotherapy, you're helping the normal cells of the body to go off replication because there's no carb, they don't replicate, and therefore you spare them the chemotherapy side effects. So that was the theory. And the more we did trials, we actually found out to be a third uh, po positive effect, which is happening every time we, we, we talk regeneration with the fasting mimicking diet, so the white blood cells regenerate and do a cancer attack. We've proven all of this in mice on multiple, multiple trials. And now we're in around eight or nine cancer trials. Extremely excited about that. Uh, one of the first trials just ended. Uh, we cannot unfortunately share the results today, but it's extremely exciting to see how fasting could impact cancer and cancer therapy. In, in humans? Or in, in humans, mice. actually. In humans, yeah. okay. So now we have, uh, we, we're about to have some proof, right? Hopefully, yeah. uh, very soon. And maybe we'll do another video when that comes out. That'll be a yeah, really interesting sure. video. And so, um, so I mean, there's a lot of oncologists out there right now that's going to roll their eyes at what you just said. Okay, I know because they rolled their eyes when I said it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, um, so we do work with a lot of oncologists in our practice, and uh, and some people some people get it and some people don't. But you can't argue against uh, against uh, some of the trials that's already been out, right? And so, for for the people out there. All they want to know is like, how is it that I'm going to starve my cancer cells, but not starve myself? It, it doesn't make any sense for them. Like, how do you explain that? Yeah, and, and this is where the fasting mimicking diet comes in. It's basically the theory is that you're nourishing the body for four days, and this is not a long term. This is not a long term starvation diet, and the fasting mimicking diet is a nourishment rather than a starvation diet. So we're nourishing your body for four days before and the day of of chemotherapy, and then during the day of chemotherapy um, is when the effect happens on the cancer. So uh, the trick is you don't trigger the sensing pathways on the normal cells of the body, but you're nourishing the body with the FMD, and which is feeding these cells, but not the cancer cells. Right, so the rebuttal is here is like, aren't you taking away caloric, intent, uh, caloric content for your own cells? Like, does that make any sense? And do people lose lean body mass on this? Um, so what we've proven with at least the early trial on a fasting mimicking diet yeah. is that there's a preservation of lean body mass. So the body, and, and again, fasting, we're bringing fasting from back from long time of human evolution, right? We didn't have enough food growing as humans for thousands and thousands of years. And the body initially, yes, goes to fat and muscle to get some of the calories, but the longer the fast, the more the body starts protecting the musculoskeletal system 
because it needs it to walk and find the next prey or the next animal. So actually the first human trial, which is already published on the fasting mimicking diet, specifically on Prolon, the product we call Prolon, is, uh, shows that lean body mass is preserved and actually you're mostly living on the fat rather than on the muscle. Okay, so in that Prolon study you're talking about, how many rounds do people do and, and, uh, and are, that you're seeing this preservation? And did you compare it with any other like water fast or anything like that? Uh, so in humans, we didn't do fasting mimic diet versus water fast because we started with water fast and people could not comply and it wasn't safe. This is actually, it's, it's funny, but this is how the fasting mimic diet started. We went into human trials on water fast. We were not the researchers at USC didn't start with the fasting mimicking diet. They were start, they were researchers in water fast. Okay. And when they went to human trials yeah. on cancer, actually, the patients, it was a tag team between USC and Mayo Clinic on uh -huh. the trial. It was water fasting only. And patients couldn't go as far as four days on water fast. It took them a year and a half to recruit maybe just 12, 16 patients. So this is why out of that necessity and out of helping people be compliant and safe, we actually find uh, for grants with the National Cancer Institute and they helped sponsoring the creation of the fasting mimicking diet. So for, for that specific wow. concern you're bringing, yeah. this is, was the essence of discovering the fasting mimicking diet. It was out of necessity to make sure that the body is nourished, there's compliance, there's safety, and then try to get the benefits of the fasting without the fast. Okay, so how many rounds of Prolon did the, did the human trial do? So the, the first human trial that we did was a trial on aging and longevity. And we basically did three rounds of the fasting mimicking diet. You only do five days. It's a prolon is a five days fasting mimicking diet. You only do it once a month. So when we say three rounds, this means three months. And then afterwards, if you want to maintain the effects, you can do it once every three or four months. You don't have to repeat it all the time. There's some people that, that want to do it back to back to back. <laughs> do, do you recommend that anyway? I, I honestly I don't because we're we're ethical scientific people and if we don't measure we don't recommend and, sure. and this is why you know we spend we spend tens of millions on research to figure out so today I'm not in a position to say hey go ahead and do it every month it doesn't mean you cannot but if I don't have that data I don't feed to we have a lot of consumers that do it every month we have actually oddly enough we have doctors and dietitians that do it once every month uh, we have some of them on 16, 17, 18 months in a row. Um, and so I don't have data to say you should do it or you should not do it. Therefore, I would say I'm, we're neutral as a company vis-a-vis -vis that. Right, right. And we, I have patients that do it once a month uh, continuously. Um, I have somebody who tried to do it back to back, which I don't recommend anyone doing. Yeah. <laughs> if they're doing the fasting. Meaning five diet. plus five. Yeah, 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 10 yeah. days in a row. That's, uh, yeah. that's not a good idea. And let me explain why actually, why we stopped at day five, yes. because refeeding, eating after day five is as important as the fast. Meaning, you know, when you do the fasting mimicking diet, um, you're inducing cellular effects and potentially you're circulating stem cells in the blood. Right. The last thing you want to do is to keep starving them because then you deplete every correction in the body. So our trials have shown that after day five, it makes sense to refeed and to actually help the correction that the body induced to kind of flourish up rather than be deprived as well. So it's better to do it cyclically rather than just do it in a row. Okay, so what you're doing is you induce some autophagy, clean up the mitochondria to clean up the cells, and have the stem cells upregulate. And that sweet spot maybe at day five, five. or day six yeah. with refeeding, right? Yes. And now you have a chance to refeed yes. those stem cells, and yes. those uh, even neuroprogenitor cells that's happening with your brain. And so that, that refeeding, you said, yes. is just as important, yes. right? So it's not like, you know, you finish the, the fasting vegan diet and you go eat like fast food or McDonald's or something like that because you're just refeeding those stem cells junk, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so there's, there's people who are intrigued by the fasting making diet. Uh, and uh, when, they, when they try it, you have really two populations. You have a population who love it and the population who, who didn't do so well the first time, either headaches or something like that, right? And we, we find in, in my practice, those people who don't do well didn't really prepare for it. So, you know, on day negative one, we call it, uh, they have what's called a food funeral where they just eat everything because they know yeah. it would be calorie restricted for the next five days. But unfortunately, that creates a lot of gut inflammation and brain inflammation. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you when you go into that, um, prolon's not really to blame, but what you ate before is possibly to blame, number one. And number two, if they have a food funeral that includes alcohol, they also do pretty terribly, right? And once again, I think it's just like you're creating more damage for trying to fix, but you're not really going anywhere. 
And so we do have uh, the group of people who uh, eat clean at least well, at least a week before, and then they do they do well after that. And then and then we have a tertiary group, and this tertiary group feels so good on this that they just want to keep doing it, yeah. <laughs> you know, over and over again. And so what for the for the public out there, you know, how do they know they're ready for the for the fast yes. for the prolong? Yeah. No, and I agree with the three groups. You know, we do see in our practice there's a third or 40%. They do it easily. They love it. They want to repeat. Yeah. There's a good group of 20, 25% that they struggle through it, but then they, they completed it and they feel really good. And there's a group that find it really difficult. And, and, and like you said, one part of the reason is how they approach it. I think there's a lot of psychological approach, especially to the first prolon box. The first time you're going into a fasting mimicking diet, you're wondering, am I going to eat tasty food? How you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be deprived of my comfort Expectations, food. yeah. So some yeah. people, they just keep pushing it or yeah. they come to it with a lot of fear. Or some people, like you said, they binge the night before and then it's a big transformation the second day. My biggest recommendation is really uh, try to take off the psychological factor. You're going to be eating really tasty food. It's not going to fe- you're not going to feel fully satisfied, but you're going to feel satisfied to a certain extent. And we've been working a lot on the taste and on the program to make it seem very friendly and, and not imposing on your on your five days. But I agree with you, it's separating, especially we see that on the first box, is how, because the second and the third time, it's actually much easier, you know, the food, you've done it, you just yeah. want to go through a discipline five day, and it's less scary than when you start the first time. Oh, absolutely. And then, um, you're right, there is a huge psychological component to it. There's an expectation that comes with the yeah. box. So, Let's tell them what's in the box. So you have a big box in, yeah. in Prolon. So, so what's what are the ingredients in it, and what are the properties of them? Yeah. So you get a you get a, fix, a big shipper box called Prolon, and when you open it, you have five smaller boxes. Each box is your food for the day, and if you open a typical day box, you're going to see breakfast, and the breakfast is is mostly the fast bar or the longevity bar, and then you have lunch, and then a snack in the afternoon, and then dinner. And the composition is in a form of food, meaning bars, soups, crackers, there's some olives, and there are drinks. You don't need to buy any other drink. When you're on the prolonged fasting mimicking diet, you have your all, all the food you need and the drinking you need. You should be hydrated, so drink water as much as you can. But you have, uh, you have teas inside, and we have um, decaffeinated tea, and then we have um, uh, an L drink. And the biggest question we get always, can I drink coffee with it? Um, initially, we used to say no because we haven't tested coffee with Prolon, but a lot of people are addicted to coffee to a certain extent. And now we say, you know, up to one cup a day, uh, should, you know, could be allowable and, and uh, you know, doing it. But the food itself, I mean, beyond the fact that it mimics fasting, I think is one of the cleanest labeled food I've ever seen in nutrition. Meaning, we don't add any preservative, we don't add any chemicals, any artificials. It's really sourcing ingredients. They're very high premium. There's a lot of high, high um, uh, premium nuts in the, in, in the food and really highly sourced ingredients from, from different continents, actually. And it's in total 66 ingredients. It gives you the macronutrients, the fat, the proteins, and, uh, and the carbs, and also some minerals and vitamins. And we have two pills, two supplementation in the box so that you go through the five days equipped. And again, it's a nourishment diet equipped with the macro and the micros. As I first went through the box, the first time I, I did it wrong. Why? Because I used the microwave. <laughs> so let's talk about um, let's talk about the preparation of what's inside. Yeah. What can you gear to? Because you know I'm, I'm on the go a lot, and then uh, and uh, and I realize I probably shouldn't use microwaves for this. So let's talk about that. Yeah, no, yeah I think there's a couple of soups that yes, you cannot use the microwave. So <laughs> yeah. everything what you, what you need for prolon is really hot water, and um, and mm-hmm. a stove is always the easiest to to boil. Yeah. I think there are two soups where they're not they're not microwavable. Uh, I agree with that, and and maybe for the future because we're always traveling. I get a lot of executives and CEO doing prolon, uh, and and they're pleading us to kind of make it all microwavable just for the soup part. The rest <laughs> doesn't need to be to be uh, right. to be uh, to be heated, and this is something we're definitely looking into. Okay, that's yeah. great. And so, um, as as so, the first time I went through the prolon, um, I, I had no issue. Actually, I don't. I haven't had any issues with any of the rounds that I've done. And so, in going through the prolon, and I noticed that because I we do it with my staff and my patients when we're all together, right? And so we see those people. Some people do well, some people don't. You know, 
And, uh, and so by the end of it, by the end of, of day five and on to day six, there are people who, who says that, well, um, you know, I, I did well. And then day six, they do terribly again, right? And uh, I know it may have something to do with the reintroduction phase, but uh, I also think that there is a big psychological component to it. By, by the end of day six, or by the end of day five, you're, you're ready to eat something, right? And eat that in that refeeding phase. And so on, in the kit, it says that day six, you have a slow reintroduction to, to, to the food, yeah. right? So what does that really look like? What is a slow reintroduction into eating again? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, once you finish prolon, and, and yeah. you mentioned some people wouldn't do, wouldn't do readjustment well. Once you finish prolon, remember your buddy went into five days of a plant-based food. Yeah. There's a microbiome potential, big, you know, swap. And some people jump the next day on a big burger and, and french fries at 11 a.m. Yeah. And this <laughs> is when you're creating fast, a big mismatch between the stomach that adjusted and the microbiome and your intestine that adjusted as well. So I think the reintroduction on day six, we call it the first refeeding day, mm -hmm. is really should be, you know, with, with more smooth and, and pseudo plant-based kind of as well uh, ingredients. So you can have your soup, you can have, uh, you know, salads, you can have, and you can start introducing fish towards the end of the day, but just don't chalk your system right after with, with you know, uh, uh, overcooked high, uh, high animal protein or fried food right away. It might create a mismatch for your, for your microbiome. Gotcha, so f uh, what should people tell their doctors if they're about to do prolon? Because there's you know, a lot of warnings, hey, consult with your physician first before yeah. you do. Like what, what should people be, be asking them if the doctor's never really heard about prolon? Yeah, so if, if I'm, I'm gonna take two profiles if you want. There's a profile of a yeah. person who is otherwise healthy, maybe a little bit overweight, uh, um, what is, is conscious about their longevity, their risk factors, their aging. And they can do prolon. It, they they don't really need a full you know medical examination, or sure. they can they can access the product. They can do it. We call them the healthy, the relatively healthy consumer. Yes. You have another group of people who you know are on a prescription medication. They probably have some metabolic risk factor that they're consulting with their physician with. And if they go to their physician and they ask about prolon, I mean, if the physician is familiar with it, then the physician can recommend how many times to do it when to do it and when to repeat it. But if the physician is not really familiar with the product, I think the best introduction is to tell the doctor about their goal. It's, it's all about what you want to achieve. And if it's longevity, if it's metabolic health, if it's weight, I think Prolon has proven to be one of the cornerstone things that you can bring back from nature and merge nature with science today and make it practical to bring back fasting to the human and I say fasting with food, not just water fast. Water fast can be a little bit damaging in certain circumstances because it's a big bankruptcy to the body. The fasting mimicking diet is a safer way and is an enhancing way. It gives, it's giving nourishment to the body at the same time. So I would talk to my doctor and tell him, really my goal is to live healthier longer. My goal is to improve my metabolic marker and my weight. And yes, there's a role for prescription medicine but this is when I'm really sick, when I really need that intervention, and maybe today I can adjust my lifestyle, improve my behavior, and use Prolon to correct that. Okay, so there are markers that you looked at in blood work and everything uh, in, in the Prolon trial, correct? Yeah, so... So what are those markers that you look at? So the main markers that you can test before and after Prolon are, um, if you're looking at, at blood testing, for example, yes. you can look at uh, uh, cholesterol, at triglyceride, you can look at CRP, marker of inflammation, and we all know inflammation today is one of the mm -hmm. main, if you want, common factor to right. a, lot of, a lot of conditions and accelerates aging. Um, and you can look, if you want to zoom into something related to fasting and aging, we, there's a molecule called IGF, insulin-like growth factor. Mm -hmm. This is a growth factor, so it marks whether the body is growing and aging or the body is fasting and, and a little bit anti-aging. So IGF particularly with prolon actually decreased big time. And besides the blood markers, you can measure your blood pressure if you have, uh, mm -hmm. if there's uh, an normalization there, or you know your weight reflects directly the weight loss. There's a, uh, we have 70, 80% of people doing prolon, they love the weight loss. It's one of the fastest way to lose weight in a healthy way because you're not losing the lean body mass and mm -hmm. you're using the other potential risk that happen uh, ideally. So you can measure your weight, lean body mass, 
uh, blood pressure and metabolic markers. So for those people on medicine, they really should be seeing, seeing their physicians and <laughs> to make sure yeah. that if the blood pressure does come down, it's not yeah. too low because of the medicines and whatnot, yes. right? Yes. And so when the, and so my, one of the, the, the top questions that we get when I introduce someone to Prolon for specific things, one of the top questions is, um, okay, well, I can do this for this month. I can do it for the following month. I can do it for the month after that. But what do I do in between? Yes. Okay. So what we tell our patients as, as a general rule is that there's a lot of data behind uh, yes. circadian rhythm fasting, which means we tell people to you can eat during the day, but when the sun goes down, you, you, sh you shouldn't be eating. There's a lot of research that's behind that, which I know you know a lot about. And for the most part, we want to keep them plant-based. Do you think that's a good strategy? Or do you think there's a better strategy for that? Yeah, I mean, I agree. This is uh, everyone after fi Prolon is five days. We have 25 <laughs> days to, to yes. I don't want to go back to my burger. I don't want to go back to my pizza. What should I eat? And, you know, we're a nutrition for longevity company. We're not just a fasting mimicking company. Mm -hmm. And we do have a lot of opinion about that. And you're going to see more of us coming into it. But we have up until now, we, we've kept it a little bit open with directional recommendations. And, and for those of, you know, you watching us in here, there's, our founder, Professor Longo, has his own recommendation that he tested through what we call the five pillars, meaning uh, what science brings that matches with, with nature and evolution, that matches with epidemiology, and then clinical trials and observational trials. It, it's, it's true when all these five pillars hit. And if you read the longevity diet book, he has some recommendations about what to eat in, 20, in the 25 days, but depending on your goal. If your goal is longevity, we, we, you know, we preach a prescatarian slash flexitarian diet, but mainly prescatarian, meaning mainly plant-based, but in order to complement a little bit more the, the omegas and, and, and the proteins that sometimes lack in the plant-based role, we, you know, eating fish uh, a couple of times a week could, could help in that sense. So if your goal is longevity, I would right. recommend a prescatarian diet. For some people who really want to have meat, they can go flexitarian in that sense. But also you have other people who have other goals to achieve and it's, it's yeah. literally goal oriented. If you're, a, if you're a, a bodybuilder or if you're really interested in, right. in, in building up your muscle, you're going to have your little bit more protein you know, oriented diet that might not be ideal for aging, but this is, this is the short term goal. Others could prefer a keto or could prefer a paleo. Uh, but from a longevity perspective, we're pretty convinced that a prescatarian diet slash plant based or what you call, you have there are a lot of namings now right. uh, 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 for for how much protein you can add animal protein etc but this is the diet that that mainly correlate with longevity now a lot of people today in the United States and in the last the latest statistics showing that intermittent fasting actually is is the number one diet in the US so a lot of people say I love the five days with prolon can I still do something with intermittent fasting can mm -hmm. I still continue the pattern and a lot of them, and a lot of you out there, um, you're probably skipping breakfast and, and what, what is known today in the market as intermittent fasting. We skip breakfast, therefore we overshoot the overnight fasting up until lunch and, and therefore you would fast for 16 hours. Um, there's a lot of conflicting data around, around intermittent fasting and around whether that's healthy or not. What we're almost sure about again, looking at the five pillars, is that if you fast for 12 hours, mm -hmm. which is what you mentioned, meaning yes. let's parallel circadian rhythm. You know, our ancestors ate up until 6, 7 p.m., then they slept, yeah. they woke up the next day, there was no refrigeration, no midnight <laughs> snacking, right. and in the yeah. morning they saved some food, they'd eat that food that they saved, and then they go and, and they, to, find, to, find, to find food again. So really, the 12 hours seems to be the safer, uh, um, and then it's, it's more complicated. There's cortisol, there's insulin in the morning, and all of that. So a lot of data is showing that you don't need to fast the 16th hour. Maybe your, your body, yes, you can lose a little bit more weight, but your body starts suffering then. This is when you get the headache. This is when, mm, yeah. and in the morning, in the morning, potentially you're going to need some macronutrients. Your brain is up. You're, you know, it's, 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 you're going to start using it, and you're, you're going to start using your body. So you want to feel that. And there are a couple of articles, actually, that, have shown that skipping breakfast could increase cardiovascular risk. Yes. There are two articles published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology showing that skipping breakfast could increase potential cardiovascular risk. There are some 
biases in these uh, in these articles. Mm -hmm. But a lot of signals, if you go to the blue zones where the highest concentration of centenarians are, right. they don't skip breakfast. So right. a lot of it's a, it's a lively discussion whether you should skip breakfast and do intermittent fasting or not. We as a company, because we have a fasting mimicking technology, seeing that a lot of people are skipping breakfast and noticing that this might not be ideal for them. There's the other thing we didn't talk about, which is the, the gallbladder stone formation. The, mm -hmm. the longer you don't eat, the more you have stone risk formation in the gallbladder. Mm -hmm. So seeing that some people who want to lose weight, and justifiably so, 70% of America is now overweight, and some people are trying to skip breakfast to lose that weight, but doubting that maybe on a longevity perspective and from a gallstone bladder formation there is a risk, we decided to actually, besides Prolon, bring the fast bar, which is the breakfast from Prolon, bring it as a separate product to the market, and we called it the fast bar, to help people eat it in the morning if they're already skipping breakfast. We don't recommend skipping breakfast and swapping it with the fast bar. We actually, if you eat breakfast, <laughs> we want you to have that breakfast. Right. Or use the bar plus other components in the morning. But if you're not having a breakfast and you want something that's high in premium nuts and high in, in, in mid-chain fatty acids or ketones for your brain, in the morning, the fast bar could be an easy uh, thing to adopt and merge potentially this weight loss with a longevity benefit. Okay, so the fast bar is a very fascinating thing because the fast bar is supposed to mimic a fast as well, right? Yes. But if you look at the macros, it's it's almost like unbelievable, yes. right? Because you do have the, the honey that's in it, right? Yes. And the nuts and everything like that. So it, ideally in any situation, you want to look at, you know, macros below a certain amount. Yes. But what you have found is that the Fast bar does some very interesting things. So let's talk about that. Yeah, and we yeah. get a lot of this question is how, how come you have honey yeah. in it? How come you have carbs in it and it's mimicking fasting? Yeah, it sounds and impossible. It goes, yeah, no, it is very, it is possible and it is proven actually yeah. part of the prolon, part of the prolon uh, and the other FMD trials. And, and because again, going back to uh, the conception of starvation versus sensing pathway on itself. So People think fasting means there should be no carb, there should be no protein, there should be no fat, and, and this is wrong. Fasting is when the cell doesn't sense food. Okay. So the cell senses only proteins and carbohydrates, the cell doesn't sense fat. So the fast bar is very high in good fats, and so these are not sensed by, by nutrient sensing pathway, and has carb and has proteins, but to levels and specific formulation and sequences, that actually nourish the body, but by the time they get to the cell, the, um, uh, the sensing pathways are not triggered. So the cells, they sense a little bit the carb, they sense a little bit the protein, but all of this is studied into a specific formulation that doesn't, uh, doesn't allow the cell to say, hey, I'm all set, I see a lot of calories, I see a lot of carbs, a lot of protein, therefore I'm not fasting. And this is the trick. Um, a lot of people think they can, they can cook something like the fasting mimic yeah. that or they mm -hmm. and and this is a big myth actually it's a very specific very sensitive formulation again it took tens of millions of dollars and 20 years of research to get to what it is and this is really an innovation meaning i'm nourishing you there is carbs there are there are proteins there are there is there, there are fat yet your cells are fasting okay so now the definition of fasting is different yes <laughs> the definition of fasting is that your body thinks you're fasting Yes. rather than the true fast, yes. right? And we found that even hormonally and even the blood work, that seems to be true, even with the fast bar, with the honey and everything yes. that's in it, right? Which um, I, I, I've been eating the fast bar probably for the last eight months um, as, my, as my little snack in the morning time, I juice as well. And so I, I do enjoy it. I never yes. really get sick of it. I do enjoy it. Um, but, uh, you know, it keeps me going throughout the day. Yes. And so I think the, the we have to shift our mindset now yes and shifting our mindset is so difficult because there's so much information out there keto and paleo yes. and there's keto paleo right yes. <laughs> there's vegan and whatnot and uh, our, our mindset is to look at the actual data that's yes. there right and so there's a lot of food crazes and diet yes. crazes and stuff like that but if we look at the data that's there i think the the, the best data i've seen is behind the fasting mimicking diet in addition to the circadian rhythm fasting as well, yes. which is really good data. And you guys want to know more about that, um, there's a great book called The Longevity Diet by Dr. Walter Longo. And it's one of the first books I read before I even uh, launched into uh, my own round of Prolon. But in that book, he talks about his journey and how he found the centenaries, the blue zones in the world. Uh, 
where people are living very long and what is really the relationship between longevity and uh, what kind of diet there is. And yeah. I thought it was just very interesting that it depends on the stage of life they're in. Yes. So vegetable heavy earlier on yes. and then maybe later in life it has some meat incorporation yes. to it as well. So if you guys don't know that book, you know, just go ahead and purchase it. It's called a longevity diet. So, but uh, that's all I had today. So thank you very much thank for the discussion. For it's been a lot yeah. of fun. So awesome. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.